Hey, John. Hey, Brian. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? Yeah, we're good. We're good. We got good weather here. Everything's nice. Awesome, man. Same here. The sun's actually shining out here in uh, Irvine, California. And uh, yeah, we've been getting a little bit of rain the past week or so, but yeah, the sun's out shining today. So typical Southern California for you. That's nice. We're we're up here in northern Japan, and the weather's chilly, but it's warming up. So it's uh, it's much nicer when you're in this period of spring when everything's every day is getting a little bit nicer. Right on, right on. So let's uh, let's get ourselves started here. You know, last week we talked about the topic of getting started, and this week I think the best topic, the the natural follow on, is the topic of sustaining our momentum and keeping going. You want to dive into that a little bit today? Yes, I do. I think it's such an important topic because we talked a lot about getting started. And I know that that's a really important topic because we want people to start chasing their dreams, start working on their goals, start working on themselves. But the, the re- reality is you get all excited and you get going and then you realize, well, it's a long road ahead of me. You know, how do I keep it going, uh, especially when uh, something gets in the way when there's an obstacle or a challenge that gets in the way. And the reality is there's always going to be something that's going to get in the way, especially if it's a really big dream. But even if it's something as small as working out every day, you know, that's that's hard in and of itself. There's always going to be something, some reason, some excuse that you could come up with that, that could slow you down or stop you from doing whatever it is you want to do. So finding a way to not only get started, like we talked about in episode one, but sustaining the effort is so important. And I know that we want to build on getting started by talking about, well, how do you keep it going? Yeah, so I I want to recap very quickly for anybody who didn't hear the last episode, the, the couple of the topics we covered in there, because I think actually they're really important for understanding this episode as well. And, mm-hmm. and that's with the, the challenges to getting started. We sort of grouped them last week and talked about the three different types of challenges. And we called them inertia, friction, and opposing forces. And uh, inertia is, if you're not moving, it's everything that's keeping you where you're at. It's it's what's keeping you stuck and not starting, right? If you are moving, the benefit is inertia is kind of what's what's got you moving, what's what's keeping you going, right? So inertia is often, I equate it with all these internal feelings, you know, especially when you're not moving, it's things like fear or doubt, or embarrassment, or lack of knowledge, uh, something along these lines. Friction right. is anything like best described as sort of how hard it is that you're whatever the thing is that you're trying to do. You know, it, there, there's going to be uh, a certain level of difficulty. And friction could be just the actual time or energy it takes to do something. It could be the difficulty level to learn it. It could be anything around like basically what makes it hard, you know. And the last one, opposing forces, is just all these other responsibilities and, and, and challenges, uh, things in your life. So it could be anything from, you know, you're in school and you're on the track team. Like we went, this is our experience when we were running at UCLA, but you still have classes. You still have other life responsibilities you have to do. They have things you have to take care of. These things are going to take away a little bit of your time, a little bit of your attention, a little bit of your energy. And as you get older and you have a job or as you have a family, these can become quite important in your life and navigating these, these forces can have a big uh, effect on on your overall success. So those are the three that we talked about. And I think they're really useful because in the context of getting started, they help to frame sort of what you're trying to overcome. But the reality is they never go away. They're always there. And after you've started, maybe the inertia is a little bit different or, and maybe there's a little less friction after you've gotten midway into your project than in the beginning. But But for the most part, as a core sort of as concepts as as types of challenges you're going to face them no matter what you're doing at whatever stage of your of the project you're working on yeah i couldn't agree more i feel like the there's always going to be uh something that that's standing in your way and what we care about is acknowledging that you know embracing the challenges because you know, I actually was, I'm reading a book right now by Eckhart Tolle, uh, mm-hmm. you know, very well-known, world-renowned uh, spiritual leader. And he said, uh, it's a book called A New Earth, Awakening Your Life's Purpose. And the cool thing about what I'm reading in that book so far, I'm about 50 pages into it, is he talks about, 
you know, just realizing that the most important thing is staying focused on what whatever your your purpose is and and allowing that to kind of pull you forward, you know, and allowing that to help you to separate from the things that are unimportant in your life. And I think that that's probably the greatest thing that I've found in my life that allows me to keep moving forward, even when things come up like a pandemic. It's definitely, there are moments where it's discouraging. I have my moments where I'm just like, it's confusing and the uncertainty can be very uh, consuming as far as your mental energy. But I, I'm always reminded of, uh, of or I fall back into this sense of optimism and, and hope and, and passion for life simply because I'm excited about the things that remind me of who I am. And that's really where I think you can sustain your momentum is remembering what you really want out of life and actually going after it. And uh, anything that comes your way when after you've done that uh, just becomes a blip on the map, so to speak. It's just another thing that you need to learn from um, that's going to help you to be even more clear on what it is that you want, not less. Yeah, I feel there's a lot of well, everything you just said, the, the more purpose you have uh, and the more the project you're working on or the, the, the goal that you have is tied to who you want to be, how you define yourself, the life that you want to live, the more you're going to have this natural uh, reservoir of energy to overcome all these obstacles that come. It's, it's, it's going to be something that you can, you can always draw on. Uh, and, and it's one of the important things is to is to sustain that reservoir of energy because even that can you can sort of lose that if you allow it to get lost and if if, if you allow people to sort of convince you that that's not a good purpose or it's not a good goal or it's it's not what you should be doing it is possible to lose that motivation that that that, that inherent motivation and so I, I think there's you know one of the best most effective ways to overcome inertia like the the challenge of getting started is to draw from that because in the beginning you need a boost of energy to get over that to get started to get over the pro being not moving to to moving but on a daily basis you need that kind of motivation as well maintaining momentum is repeating the exact same process that you use to get started in the beginning but on a micro level like you've already you already have a little bit of momentum but it's every day you still got to go do the work required to achieve whatever it is you're trying to achieve just because you started the project doesn't mean it will it will automatically finish by itself. You have to put that work in, and that means every day you have to get yourself in that position to do the work and be ready to do it when you're there. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I feel like that's probably one of the coolest things about getting started is you realize that there is work that needs to be done, and you have to establish a routine around that. And that's I, I love that you're bringing that up because... I don't know how anybody that's successful is successful without having a routine, you know, in terms of achievement, right? If you see somebody like, um, I mean, you can use the biggest names, you know, recognizable names of iconic human beings or figures, right? Like a LeBron James. And you think, well, he's, he's 6'8", 250, 60 pounds, and he's built like a Greek statue. He was not, he was born to do what he's doing, but... There's a lot of people that are built like LeBron James that may even have similar skill set like LeBron James, but don't have the same work ethic as LeBron James, you know? And so that's a critical part of what you're saying is, number one, the inertia, finding your purpose. Number two, to sustain it and, and to actually make progress, you actually have to have some type of consistency uh, with which you're, you're working on that thing. And, and, and a routine allows for you to have that consistency, I believe. Uh, this is my big my big thing. I think success for pretty much anyone, you can look at it and you can see what you're looking for. So if you're looking for talent, you can always find talent in successful people. If you're looking for hard work, you can always find the hard work. Um, and if you're looking for consistency, you'll find the consistency. But the reality is they're always there. And you, you rarely ever find somebody who's successful that doesn't have consistency and a very productive routine baked into what it is that they're being successful at. You know, from a business perspective, you see this with CEOs all the time. The best CEOs, they're up at a certain amount, at a certain hour in the morning. They have a routine that they do in the morning that centers them on what they want to get done for the day. They've got accountability checks throughout their day for what, what are they reviewing? What are they approving? What are they 
looking at and athletes are the same way their training regimen is is defined it's it's consistent it's repeated the way i always put this is it doesn't matter if you do the best workout in the history of workouts it's not going to make you a champion one workout will never make you a champion it doesn't matter how good that one workout is you need hundreds or thousands of very good workouts strung in a row to get you to that level so the mindset that all great athletes have and I mean, it almost seems silly to say it, but if you look at any great athlete, it's every day they put in the work and they put in really high quality work. And, and that is how they get to the level they get to. They don't go out and try to nail one workout and then just sort of relax for the rest of the time. Like it's, that's, that mentality doesn't actually lead to excellence. It's the consistency that does. Do you remember when, when we were in college uh, at UCLA and you told me like when I met you as a freshman, you were starting to kind of figure it out, right? Like starting to get your, be, become the runner that I saw you as um, yeah. when, I, when I got there. But you said before I got there, you weren't that runner. And I'm just wondering, curious if you remember like what you were doing because it was, it was actually pretty interesting to watch. I didn't know to the extent that you weren't as good as you were at the time that I met you, but you were finishing in the, the top 10 of, every single cross country race and these are super highly competitive division 1 competitions throughout the United States against top the top guys in in the United States and you went on um I believe you were an all american right in cross country did you did you didn't make it no no i, oh, I had a, okay. i had a bad race at NCAAs but that was okay. my, so, my only bad race of the year <laughs> really oh right exactly but you know it was you know so what i remember about that was number one you were always consistent you did all these things you were doing all the little things you were leading the team in the way in which you approached your training your mentality everything was super 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 consistent but your improvement the way that you were racing was so impressive to me and one of the coolest things that I thought was pretty interesting was you adopted a racing style that worked for you. And it was it's so hard for a lot of people to do this, but just in general, for all you running running geeks out there, this was the coolest thing. So Brian would start out in the middle of the pack or even in the back of the pack of the race, but his strategy was to pick up the pace and the momentum throughout the race. And he ended up, you would think that he, he started so far back, you would think there's no way in heck he can finish in the top five or the top 10 of these highly competitive Division One cross-country races, and yet you did every time. And you did it all the way to the point that got you to nationals, and I think you just had a bad day. But honestly, if you would have had just the same kind of quality race and effort that you had at every single race that season, I honestly believe you would have easily finished in the top 25 uh, in the in the Division One uh, cross country championships, I truly, truly believe that. But the way in which you approached it was just so awesome. I and I I think you should talk a little bit about that approach that you took because as an eighteen year old kid, now thirty eight, um, still a kid <laughs> in, in some <laughs> ways. I I I still admire how you did what you did. Uh, because I know that it was a jump and an improvement, but I didn't know how dramatic of a jump it was. Yeah, you know, as a freshman, I write about this a little bit in the book I've been writing in the intro because it's weird to think about now for me, but I showed up at UCLA as a freshman and I literally knew nothing about running. I, I, I thought I knew about running, but I, I knew nothing at all about running. And, and I was what I would call a disengaged runner. Like I did the workouts and I did my practices, but I didn't think about running. Like I would do my practice at high school and then I would just go home and never think about running. Like it, 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 I wasn't, I didn't think of myself as a runner. I just thought of myself as like somebody who was talented and ran fast and that was, and that was it. And so I get to UCLA and my first few years, I just sort of uh, was very inconsistent I trained and I trained hard. I did I did what people asked, but I I didn't really dive into the sport of running and really commit myself to running. And when I say that it's I didn't ask myself, well what are all the great runners doing and how should I be training like them? I just sort of I just sort of floated along, right? And I, I sort of lacked a little bit of guidance. Uh, I needed a little bit more a, a little bit more hand holding. I was kind of immature in that in that regard. And um what ended up happening for me was was really a shift in mindset uh, by taking some courses that challenged me to think a little bit differently. Ironically, it was more about learning theory, and, and it, but it was the theory of, of, of achievement was one of the topics we talked about. The fundamental thing for me was I adopted a mindset 
that I think I shifted to focusing on the quality of my work and the consistency of my work with the assumption that if I put in high quality and, I, and I'm high, consistent about it, that it will naturally result in me being successful. I don't really need to worry about the end result. I just need to worry about the process. And I adopted that. And that's right around the time when you came, right? So for the summer before, and I really got focused on doing all the little things and just being very consistent. And immediately I saw a huge, a huge improvement in my running. And it all makes sense to me now, but at the time I, I, I was blown away by how much it improved. So that season, when I was putting in all the work, I was very much a different person in my in my mind. I, I was a completely different person from my third year to my fourth year at school because I just, I, I viewed everything about my life differently at that time. And all of it was focused on an, on quality and consistency and not focusing on a, a sort of an arbitrary end result, but just trusting that I will get to that result if I just focus on the daily work. Now that doesn't answer the question about the racing strategies and stuff, but that, but, but as a lifestyle approach, that's how I viewed it. That's how I viewed it. And that's what led to my success. It totally answers it. And it's so funny. So I wrote down a couple of things that I think are really important as well. And I know we were going to talk about pursuing the Olympics and, and stuff like that and, yeah, yeah. and how I sustained my momentum in that. I could touch on that, on that briefly, but this is really cool because it's it, it's honestly touching on the same key points that I would highlight in my effort to become a sub four minute miler to become you know an an Olympic alternate. I didn't compete in in, in Beijing in two thousand eight. You guys, just to be clear, uh, you know, but uh, in many ways, I, I still did make the Olympic team. I was officially named to the team, so that was super super cool. But just so that everybody knows, I don't want to mislead anybody as far as like you know what I actually achieved and and, and everything, but. Uh, I think one of the key things about what you're saying that's very similar to my effort to become an Olympic athlete is the things that you did to improve, period. It does, it, it applies to everybody and everything and, and to what extent certain things work out. I, I think there are certain variables. Like I, I believe that you probably could uh, have been, you know, a very successful marathoner. You know, I think that obviously you were, you're a gifted runner and you were good enough to be successful. And I think that if you would have continued applying what you applied in that period of time in your running career uh, collegiately, I think that would have translated into more success. I don't think it would translate into less. I think you that simple approach of not worrying about the end result, focusing on the process. Believe it or not, I quit the UCLA team for a, for a, an extended period of time, my fourth year in college, and the thing that allowed me to come back and be successful was that key thing, focusing on the process, not the end result. When I let go of my desire, and I was ex obsessed with this desire of becoming, uh, you know, a champion, an Olympic champion, an NCAA champion, and, and winning races at the highest level and running these certain uh, times, hitting these certain marks and hitting these personal bests, and, and I wasn't happening. I got so consumed with what wasn't working out and so negative energetically that I was not able to improve at all. And, and more importantly, I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. When I focused on the process, man, I, it was like night and day. It, and it happened overnight. It happened so quickly because it was always there. I just wasn't allowing myself to be successful because I was focused on the end result. So the advice is focus on the process, get obsessed with just the day-to-day -day work and really enjoy each and every little thing. It might seem like doing something super small and simple as you're going through the process of building a business, working on your health, improve, trying to improve as a runner, and it's going to take a lot of time, but it's a journey. And you're supposed to be consumed with the first part of the journey, the next part of the journey, each step, because it's all critical and it all adds up to something bigger. And you never know how quickly you're going to progress but there will be big moments of improvement and some moments where there's no improvement. But you're always moving forward even when it doesn't seem like you are if you consistently go through and focus on the process. And that's what I saw in you. I saw that and, and just witnessing it profoundly impacted the way that I feel about the process and trusting the process. You know, I have this uh, framework that I, when I talk about goals with people um, and my students and, and stuff is, I think there are two kinds of goals. There are what I call North Star goals. 
which is the goal that's way out there on the horizon, the big, the big goal way out there that you're pursuing. And that goal is great because it keeps you pointed in the right direction. The path might take you a little bit off track. You might get, you might get held up. You might have some problems along the way, but if you can see that North Star goal and keep yourself oriented toward it, you'll always find your way back to heading in the right direction. And that's, that's the value of the North Star goal. It's like you could, some people define that as their purpose. It could be your, the dream. It could be whatever it is that you want to achieve, right? I'm really good at having North Star goals. You are, you are very much driven by North Star goals as a, as a, as a default personality, right? And, and I, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely my default. <laughs> that's definitely, so, so then the, but there's another kind of goal. And the other kind of goal I call a next step goal. And the next step goal is literally what is the actual next step you're going to take? And what, why are you going to take that, that step? And what is the benefit of taking that step? And what is the best way to take that step? And if you think about it from the sense of, uh, I use this analogy with my students is like the North Star goal is kind of like the destination if you're, if, you're, if you're planning a long trip. And the next step goal is like your turn by turn navigation, right? It's like you're analyzing your overall journey and saying, well, you know what? I should turn right here and then I should go down this road and turn left here. Like that's what Google Maps is doing for you on an automated way. In the same way with your whatever you're trying to achieve, having the North Star goal is great and having that defined and knowing what it is and knowing where you want to end up. But the reality is you don't necessarily know what road you're going to have to take because somewhere down the road, the road you think you're going to take might get blocked for some reason and you're going to have to find another way. So you have to be sort of open to that idea of, of choosing the best path available to you in that moment. And the next step goal is about maximizing whatever whatever route you've chosen is, is about getting the most out of it. And for me, the next step goal from an athletic perspective, what you're talking about here is it's today's workout or to, not even today's workout. I actually t- think it's a little bit broader. It's today in general, because the workout from a running perspective is only what, I don't know, two hours of your day, three at the most, if you're including stretching and core workout and all these other things. The funny thing about being a runner is that you don't spend that much time practicing uh, in your day. You have 24 hours in the day and you probably spend three or four of them actively working out. And all the rest is time spent doing whatever it is that you do during that time. But you can maximize that time too. And I, what I started doing as an athlete, what made a big difference for me was I really started to focus on the quality of my execution in my practice. Like, am I getting the most out of this this workout? Do I understand why I'm doing this workout and what I'm supposed to get out of this workout? I started having conversations that I never had with coaches, which is like, well, why, what should I be trying to do here in this workout? And I would take that advice and I would try to execute on, on whatever it is that coach Peterson or coach, coach, uh, Lehman Winters, Helen would tell me, this is what we're trying to do. But then in my outside of that, in my, in the rest of my life, I started to build a lot of routines to just maximize that time like for stretching for i'm going to eat a little bit better i'm going to stop going out with people at night and doing things that make me tired in the morning here's a really simple one i'm going to lay out a yoga mat in the morning before i go for my my morning jog so that when i come back i can just start stretching and just i i used to not stretch well after my morning run because i would just sort of be lazy about doing it but i started laying out the yoga mat beforehand and setting it up so that when i got back it was just ready for me i didn't have to think about it i would just sit down and start stretching and these little things, I started looking for these little areas like that to, to, to make my life easier, to, make, to trigger me to do the work that I knew I wanted to do, but to just to make it easy, right? And to focus on the quality of doing that, of that work instead of worrying about the North Star goal. I, just, I, I could keep my eyes on the North Star goal. I could look at it whenever I wanted to. It, what I really wanted to focus on was what am I doing right now in this moment? Denzel Washington says this amazing quote, dreams without goals are filled with regret hmm. or something like that. Like he says something like that where he basically says, I totally messed that up. So, <laughs> uh, but he says something about where he says, look, you can have basically what he's saying is, and I'll look up the, I got to look it up and, and figure that out. But you know, basically what he's saying is that when he says something about like dreams and goals, right? You can have dreams, but if you don't have goals, they're just like empty promises to yourself that will fuel regret in your life. So it's something like that, right? So yep. what he's what he's saying is that you need to have something big that you're shooting for. And there's got to be things that's going to, uh, that you're preparing for, right? So that, that kind of keeps you accountable to working on your goals. You can't just say, I'm going to work. I want to 
I want to be a great runner, but you never compete, right? And and I want to make an Olympic team, but there's there, you're not doing anything that's challenging you along the way and testing you and seeing where you're at and giving you perspective that kind of pushes you along and that also forces you to prepare for those little things that's going to lead to the bigger thing. You always need to be held accountable for what you're actually working towards and you and you need little things to shoot for, which are goals that that keeps put, propelling you forward and ultimately can lead you to the destination of that North Star goal. So to, I guess to kind of like bring it home, the idea is this. You need to have something that you're working towards, right? You have to have a dream. You need to break down how you're going to approach that dream with goals. And those goals are, are can be as simple as writing something down and checking it off, like sending an email, uh, asking for an opportunity or seeking an opportunity for a writing project or speaking at a school or performing for an audience at a nightclub, right? If you're a singer or something like that, uh, or a DJ. And that's your goal. You know what your goal is, but you have to have something that you're you're doing every day. And those little things that you're doing every day are the goals. Like those are the broken down things that you're trying to achieve, trying to get done, trying to accomplish and complete that's going to push you forward. And those bigger goals have to also have little things that you're able to use to test yourself, whether it's saying, hey, I'm going to have somebody look at what I did. So I have to actually have something completed to share with somebody so they can look at it, give me feedback, and I can keep working on it. If you're a writer, it's providing some type of chapter and sending it to an editor to review. Having that editor give you a deadline and working on that deadline, without that editor, without that deadline, even though your goal is to write the book, you're probably going to struggle to write the book because you're going to struggle to accomplish the smaller little incremental things that lead to you actually writing a book. And I think that applies, that thought process, uh, or that process applies to anything. Big goals, lots of big dreams, lots of goals, and all the little things that you can do to be held, held yourself accountable to hit the smaller marks that will lead you and continue to push you towards the bigger marks. That's that's how you. I watched you do it. That's how I did it as an Olympic athlete. It's not super complicated, but it is challenging, and it requires you to do to be somewhat meticulous with that effort required to to actually get get somewhere you know i don't know if you knew this as you were saying but you know last week when we did our podcast about getting started we talked about three three strategies one was tell someone tell someone what you're trying to do and make that commitment because it will enforce it will force you to to do the work to live up to that commitment right the second one was to take micro steps and the third one was to just get to one right just get get to the get the first thing done everything you just described was exactly, you just basically repeated those steps in your story about telling somebody what you're doing and having the accountability, like you, you mentioned the editor, right? By telling someone, you create that accountability for yourself. And actually that's one of the strategies that's really effective for maintaining momentum is finding an accountability partner to tell them what it is that you're working on and have them effectively check your work, right? To hold you accountable for the work that you, you're committed to doing it for yourself. But it just it just helps to have somebody checking on you and and that could be your coach that could be your manager that could be your wife or your partner it could be it could be whoever it is you need it to be but having somebody who's aligned with your goals and able to sort of check your progress or 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 guide you along that way is really critical to to maintaining momentum it's it's yeah. really really important and the second I one I think it's one of, I think it's one of the biggest ones because if you just keep stuff in your head I think it's it's very easy. If you keep it in your head, you don't write it down and, and you don't share it with somebody. I think it's hard for you to have it become concrete and have it be something that you actually are consistently working on. The momentum isn't like wildly crazy in the beginning because it's you're trying to overcome the inertia, right? Yeah. You know, you're yeah. trying to generate the energy and the momentum in the first place. But once you do get started, the ball is rolling and you want to keep it going and you got to find ways to, to keep it going. And that's for sure. One of the biggest, biggest ones is sharing it, talking about it, writing it down, owning it, thinking about it consistently and, and having somebody kind of re reflect that idea or dream back to you that then forces you to do some more analysis of that thing and, and questioning of like, 
well, do I really want it? What should I really, what can I do to do it? And what am I willing to do right now? And what can I do right now uh, to get started and then keep it going? And once you've told somebody, it's very hard to ignore the dream and the goal that you have for yourself. And then once you start working on it, take that big next step, which is establishing type, some type of routine. You know, putting the mat down on the floor so that you'll stretch when you wake up in the morning. Uh, you know, or putting the journal uh, out so that, you know, by your nightstand. So it's, it's always staring at you and, and it's in a place where you'll, you'll always be and have a chance to sit down and write something, whether it's just a word or whatever. But you start writing, you know, and, and you're setting yourself up for that kind of success. So, I mean, ultimately, that's we want you guys to sustain momentum. We want everybody to sustain the momentum that they generate when they get started. But I, I, I love some of the things that we've highlighted, which is, you know, I think uh, applicable to anything, in, in all honesty. Yes, I, my, I am number one on for me uh, uh, is routines and consistency. That's, that's it for me. Uh, even, even accountability is second to me. Having, a, you know, telling someone and, be, and ho- having them hold you accountable, it's really important. I, I, don't, I would never uh, say that it's not. It can make a big difference. But the routine is the most important thing. And I am a big believer that disciplined people always have really productive routines. But the thing is, is that disciplined people don't have those routines because they have a lot of willpower and that they they are using that willpower to stick to their routines. My, my, coin, my phrase I coined for this, I call this the discipline illusion. People who are not disciplined look at disciplined people and think, oh my God, I don't know how they can live that way because it's got to take so much energy to maintain that discipline. And in reality, it's an illusion because disciplined people have built the discipline into their lifestyles. Like they don't, they're not even, they're not making decisions. They're not, they're not using willpower. They just do what they do. Like they, their routine is their, is just their default and they don't think twice about it. Like that's, that's just how it is. And it's because they've already prioritized. They've already made the decisions. They've built the habits. They've built all that into their routine. And so actually like a disciplined person is sometimes like doing the minimum lazy thing. And it's so much more productive than an undisciplined person because they've just built it into a habit. And I think the more you can look at your routines and structure them, and I really emphasize this always with uh, with my students when they're learning and other things is when I was coaching athletes, I would tell them is at the end of the day, make your environment work for you. If you want to stretch, then set up the place where you want to stretch so that it's easy to stretch. Like don't make stretching hard. Make stretching as easy as possible. If you want to keep a training journal, don't hide the journal somewhere where you you have to go work hard to go pull it out and start working. Put the journal where it's, where it's going to be easy for you to fill out the journal. For all of these, if you want to if you want to write a book, don't make your environment any harder than it has to be. Figure out the best, most ideal environment for writing, and do your best to set it up so that so that you don't have any extra friction in your process. Like if you're adding friction to your process, you're you're making it harder for yourself. So one of the best things you can do is aim to have routines that are effectively frictionless. And Perfect. If, if you can That's do perfect. that, yeah, it, you will sustain momentum because you're just going to, if your environment is going to be working for you instead of against you. Yeah. Setting yourself up for success. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. Yep. Yeah. Well, John, I think we're going to keep this one short. Yeah. I think that you guys get the point. You know, we want you to get started and have the courage to do so. And we're going to uh, keep talking about that. Um, every single podcast in some way, shape, or form, that's going to come up. We want to keep you motivated and, and inspired to get started chasing your dreams, working on your goals, and breaking down how to do that. But, you know, for sure, you know, once you do get started, uh, the goal is to keep you going and create less friction in your life. That's the ultimate goal. If you find you're some, doing something is hard, find a way to make it easier to do it so you can keep going. That's it. That's right. It's the exact same as, as uh, the same tools you need to get started. Those are the things that are going to keep you going, but you have to think about them a little bit differently. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. This is awesome stuff. I always feel like I learned something from you as a business partner and also as the, the lead editor and writer here. You do all our blog articles on our website, and um, I think every single one of those articles highlights a lot of what we're talking about right now. Uh, you guys definitely need to check out those articles at gobemore.co when you have a chance. And we, we wish you guys all the best uh, as you're dealing with the, you know, the situation caused by the global pandemic with uh, COVID-19. Stay safe, uh, keep dreaming, and, and uh, you know, looking forward to talking to you guys again next time. John, I'm not going to end it yet. 
I'm going to, I want to add something. You just made me think about it. The global pandemic, oh. the situation we're in, the stuff that you're working on, that this is a wonderful opportunity to take a step back and analyze the routines you used to have and build some new ones that you need to get through what you're going through today. But when you co- when we come out of this, if you can come out of this global pandemic with knowledge of what your routines weren't working well for you in the past and some ideas for ways that you can reduce friction, that you can make those routines more productive for you, we actually have a great opportunity right now to reevaluate. And it's something that is really hard to do on the fly when you're in the middle of it. And I hadn't thought about it until you, until you mentioned it right now. And when you mentioned the global pandemic and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, you know, what's going to happen in a couple months is we're going to start coming out of this and everybody's going to start looking again to their North Star goals and what it is they want to be achieving with their careers and with their lives. And if people had unproductive routines before and you are falling back into them, it, it feels like that's a wasted time right now. Like this is a great opportunity to take a look at it find an accountability partner, tell people what you're aiming to do, tell people the type of person you're, you're, you're intending to be, look at your routines, figure out ways that you can make them frictionless. And when you are able to really start going after it again, put yourself in a position to be ready. That's, that would be my best advice for how to, how to take like what we've just been talking about in this podcast and try to actually apply it right now in this moment. So I thought we were ending a couple minutes ago. I, I extended the ending a little bit, but I really want everybody to come out of this pandemic and this lockdown and this shelter in place in a, I would love to have people come out of this in a better position than they went in. And most people won't financially. I mean, mean, almost nobody's going to come out of it better financially, but emotionally, mentally, productively, there are ways that you could, we could come out of this better. And I hope we all take advantage of them. Couldn't agree more. All right, everybody, please like, and subscribe. Tell your friends, by all means, send us some feedback. You can do that in the show notes. Any articles we've talked about, we will link to them in there. For John, I'm Brian. We are what the world is chasing, and we hope that this podcast will help you become what the world is chasing too.